So here I'd be arguing with somebody at the door, telling them that they're not saved and they need to, rep, you know, repent and pray this prayer because they didn't tell me that they prayed a prayer and asked the Lord to forgive them. Or they may say, yes, I did pray a prayer, but they go to a non-denominational church and that equals, oh, you're going to hell because you don't go to an independent Baptist church. I started noticing like you would talk to people at the door and you would get them to pray the prayer, but there would be no result of, no fruit of that individual ever coming and turning their life, you know, around. Like you wouldn't see them be a part of the church. You wouldn't see them like, it was just, they would say this prayer, just either A, to get you off their doorstep or B, just because of out of obligation, like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll say the prayer. And that was it, right? And I was, I started thinking like, are we actually sharing the gospel with people? Or are we just getting them to say a prayer so we could have a number to say, oh man, we had five people pray the prayer last week and, and trust Christ. And, you know, and then it's like, okay, so where are those individuals? You know, we knew there was something wrong, but it was kind of like we were afraid to admit it at yeah. first. Hey guys, it's Jen here with P40 Ministries. And about eight months ago, last summer, 2022, I started doing all these interviews. I didn't know what I wanted to use them for. I kind of lost my passion for them after I did about seven or eight interviews. But I recently went back to them and I'm like, these are so cool. I want to share these interviews because they're more like testimonies. And I think that they can definitely help a lot of people, which is why I decided to start uploading them primarily and basically only to YouTube. So the first interview that I'm going to be sharing with you guys is actually my sister, Jamie, and my brother-in-law, Mike. They used to be prominent members of the IFB church. If you guys don't know what IFB is, that's okay. It is Independent Fundamental Baptist, which is also the church denomination that I grew up in. But thankfully, my parents got out of it when I was about 12 years old. But unfortunately, my sister and my brother-in-law did not get out of it as quickly as me and my parents did. And they were stuck in it for a lot longer. And they're going to share their escape from the IFB church, some of the things that they had to deal with in the IFB church, and some of the problems that they encountered. So this is their testimony. And once again, I want to apologize because I did these interviews last year, not really knowing what I want to do with them. You'll notice that I say that uh, this is a Saturday podcast episode and it's not. And I also expected only to do audio for like a podcast kind of setting and ended up using the video also. So forgive the mess in my closet behind me because I did not expect to be doing a video as well as the audio. So forgive that. But nevertheless, I really hope that you guys are touched by this interview. This is going to be one of several that I am starting. And this is part one of Jamie and Mike's escape from the IFB church. Hello and good morning, friends and faithful listeners, and welcome to this special Saturday podcast episode. And today we have two guests, and this is actually my brother-in-law, Mike, and my sister, Jamie. And yeah, I'm excited to uh, share their stories with you guys, or hopefully they are excited to share their stories with you guys because <laughs> they do have interesting stories that is for sure about their church history tell us about your upbringing and obviously jamie i know a little bit about your upbringing but the audience doesn't so tell us a little bit about your upbringing and whoever wants to start first can go ahead i'll go ahead mike <laughs> oh, okay so um I grew up in church. Uh, my mom was um, a pastor's kid. Um, so my grandfather pastored a independent fundamental Baptist church uh, for a really long time. So I've always been a part of that denomination. My parents were pretty heavily involved in, in that because that's what they've known. And that's just kind of everything that I, I knew as well. As for me, um, of course, I grew up in a family where my dad was not a Christian and my mom was learning 
uh, she was a Christian and just kind of learning. So we, we had tried out like different churches with family and, um, for a while we were at a Lutheran church and, um, my dad never participated in that, um, really in my younger years. And then, uh, so my mom tried to kind of consistently keep me in church and teach me those things, but we really started going to church at, like Mike said, independent fundamental Baptist church. And, um, that church was just really friendly and we felt like we finally found something that we fit in with. My dad started, our our dad kind of started going in and it was about the time, Jen, when you were two, I think two or three, you were in the nursery and we just started going to that church. And, um, I don't know that we agreed with everything in it, but we were like, wow, you know, these people are friendly. They love God. They're trying to teach the truth and it's great. Um, so that's kind of just how we got into it. And then, um, the pastor that was there at the time recommended a Christian college that was associated with their denomination. And I ended up going to school there. That's where I met Mike. And, um, and then upon graduation, we, we got married and then we went straight to another independent fundamental Baptist church. And we can call that IFB. That's yes. kind of so. Because independent on, fundamental Baptist is sort of a mouthful. It's a mouthful. <laughs> so we can call them IFB. And maybe you're familiar if if you've ever heard of this, sometimes they'll call them fundies. Um, Say that so, one more time. You broke fun- up. Uh, I'm sorry. So sometimes they'll call uh, the IFB movement people in that fundies. So we could say that too. But anyway, Mike and I went to our first church to uh, kind of lead a youth group. I was the secretary of the church. And that's where we started out in ministry. And that's what this story is about. Right. I might add that I was kind of really ingrained into it because I grew up in it but I didn't become a Christian until I was uh, 19 years old. And that was because I went to a um, young men's home for um, drug, uh, drug addiction and stuff. And um, that was a IFB based type ministry. And I spent a year there. And so like, I really got pumped full of the, um, IFB doctrine and stuff like that. But I, I mean, God did use it. I did become a Christian. And so that's all that I knew. And I figured that anything else that was not like that, it had to be wrong. So that's. And, and we'll talk about the mindset behind this because um, part of this is if, if you hear our story, some people will be like, huh, how, how did this happen to you? What, 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 what were you thinking? Why didn't you leave? What, what was this? And um, it's, it's a little deep, the mindset behind it. And um, it's helpful to share it. And that's why we're doing this because, um, you know, when we tell our story, it's not like this huge abuse. We were like physically like beaten or went through some hardship, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually, this was, um, this was a struggle. And we know many people that have gone through it or coming out of this or in, in just a dangerous church, um, something dysfunctional going on in your church where you can leave and, and knowing the difference and, and trying to help people through that is important. Yeah. And just, uh, my brief time, I suppose with the IFB church, because like you guys said, I was two when I started going to it. And I think we stayed there for just about 10 years. Actually, I think it was my birthday when we officially left was my last Sunday there. And uh, it was my 12th birth. Yeah, it was my 12th birthday. Let's clarify. You left, but you're part of the story too, Jen. Like, why (laughs) did you leave? I mean, it wasn't like you're like, we're leaving. Uh, No, you got kicked out. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got kicked out of the church. Our entire family. Basically, what happened there was uh, my mom 
Well, actually, it had less to do with my mom and more to do with the pastor. But the pastor was just kind of, how do I say this? He was mentally abusing this kid who was going through some struggles. And this kid just needed a father figure. And that pastor was not there for him. So he ended up kicking out that boy who was the same age as me, a 12-year-old kid, his entire family who needed somebody. So my mom ended up like asking the pastor, why did you do this? Crying. You know, like she was cry- yes. crying. Now, I was already married. We weren't going to that church at the time. You just got married. It was like really soon. I had really got married and at that church, actually. And, you know my mom calls me and she's like crying and she's like, I need to talk to the pastor. I mean, not just I'm mad. I'm upset. No, this, she was like broken over this boy. Like, how can we help him? What can we do? So anyways, they were, they were close to our family. And so, um, so what ended up happening was mom confronted the pastor and like brought him the Bible and was basically like, where does it say in the Bible to kick out a young boy in need and so the pastor was i think what he said was well if you don't uh, if you don't like it you're also you can also be kicked out i want to uh, this is a quote i believe if you don't if you don't trust your pastor you can leave and then well no no no, i don't want to leave i don't want to leave you know mom's like i i'm not no no i wasn't leaving i just i'm just curious where is your biblical standpoint on this? Because I'm missing it. And I just, I want to learn. I want to understand. And then it was, if you don't trust your pastor, leave. That's what you're going to find in a lot of these IFB churches. Uh, Not all of them, but the way that they handle problems. Number one, if it's something that they can't handle, like if they don't know how to handle it, they'll just basically ostracize you till you feel awkward enough and you do leave or they kick you out or um, it all comes down to a thing where, you know, you have to obey the pastor in everything. Now, granted, there is scripture that says, you know, obey them to have the rule over you, but not in the sense of if they are doing things that are extra biblical, if they're doing things that are unscriptural, you, you don't have, you don't have to obey uh, somebody like that. And yeah, fortunately they, a lot of these pastors are so um, power hungry, power hungry. Yeah. That they want to be able to make up other people's decisions and they want them to obey blindly about stuff that's, I mean, unscriptural. Yeah. The purpose of this, we want, we want to make this clear. This is not to bash brothers and sisters in Christ. People, you know, we, this is serious because this is the church and the church is to be the pillar and ground of truth. But the danger here is when you have a church, church leaders who are um, abusing the sheep, abusing, taking Bible verses and running with them without context and not not seeing the whole picture of what the Bible's teaching and just taking this little line in scripture and being like, you must obey, you must do this. And we're going to tell you what the Bible says and you're going to obey or mm-hmm. else. And right. that is dangerous. And that's what, that's where we're going here. It's not to bash. Um, it is to help. Yeah, it's, help. it's not to show the church's dirty laundry. <laughs> no, no, not at all. But it's to help people who are, possibly in situations like this to see the danger before it gets out of hand. You see the danger and you don't leave Jesus Christ. Yeah. You, no. you leave the situation and you, you do it in a godly way. Right. 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 Yeah. Okay. So mo- going back to the story though, at uh, the church that I grew up in, we got kicked out and it was almost like we were like excommunicated. <laughs> You lost I, lost, all of I lost all my all, friends. All of them. All of them. Except for one who is still my friend. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I lost all my friends. Like nobody remained in contact with me. And as a 12 year old kid, that is tough. You go from having friends that you see 
on a weekly basis, if not more, probably much more than that, to having nobody. So, yeah, we hear a little bit about, um, you know, your guys' involvement in the church. But, Mike, if you don't mind, could you go a little bit more into your backstory and talk about that if you're comfortable with that, with how you went to the homes for the boys? Oh, yeah. So, like um, like I said, it was a, it was a faith-based um character building addictions recovery type program. Um, you know, and basically, um, you got, it was like 13 years of church in one year. So like, it was like hardcore, like it was like boot camp, like Christian boot camp on steroids or something like that. <laughs> so like upon leaving there, you know, I, yes, I became a Christian, but there were so many things like I can, re- I can recall, um, like, well, for example, like a big thing within IFB is King James only the King James translation of the Bible. So, um, other, other versions such as like the NIV, uh, NASB, ESV, those are all kind of looked down upon as not being the word of God. Oh, they're not just looked down upon. Well, yeah, they're, they're not, they don't even, sometimes they'll make jokes and it's not, right. they won't even call them versions. They'll say those they're, perverts. Yeah, perversions. Perversions, but, yeah. Like, you know, like I heard teaching, you know, while I was there about, you know, King James only, all this kind of stuff. Now you got to remember, I grew up with the King James, even though I wasn't a Christian, um, but it was just more, it was just reinforced more that like, there is no other Bible. And I can recall one distinction, like one, one thing that happened one time was I was, we had like a little library there and the man that was the superintendent, like the, you mean at the, at the homes, right? At the homes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if anybody wants to Google this again, it's, it was called the, uh, Roloff Homes, it's R-O-L-O-F-F, and it's down in Corpus Christi, Texas. There's a lot of crazy stories with all of it. But anyways, um, I remember being in the library, and the man that kind of directed the young men's home, he was in there, and he's like, here, I want you to help me clean out this library. And so like, we, we were going through these books, these like Christian books, and I mean, there was like, I'm sure there was probably really good Christian material there that could help you know, somebody learn how to grow in their walk with the Lord and stuff like that. So what he would do is he'd open up to the very first page and where it would say like Bible quotations are taken from. If it did not say King James version, like if it said like Bible quotations are taken from NASB, whatever, he'd be like, this is straight out of hell. And he'd like throw it up against the wall. Right. <laughs> and like, I'm not kidding. We like probably took probably about two garbage bags full <laughs> of books out of this room. I like there was only like three books left on the bookshelf. Because you know? like those were the only ones that you could read because they had King James Version quotes. And there was probably really good stuff that we threw away that probably could have been a real big help to other people. Um, At the yeah. time though, you didn't recognize this as weird, did you? No, I, I thought, I thought, oh yeah, why are we letting that, that demon, you know, stuff in here and you know, I mean, just stuff like that. Or for example, one other big thing is uh, uh, doing door to door. They call it soul winning. So where you go from door to door and you go with a partner and you knock on people's door and you ask them, you know, if you were to die today, are you hundred percent sure you go to heaven? And, you know, just being indoctrinated in all of that, um, which yeah, I'm sorry, I, I'm laughing because <laughs> <laughs> we, we all have to laugh. I know, I know. I'm but, laughing because I remember this. Right. And how dumb is it to send like a ten year old kid to people's right. doors? Right. And we're gonna have we're gonna have And you did it, didn't you? Well, I did. Yeah, yeah did. I was like well, ten years old. The thing is, is like I'm not against like sharing the gospel. Please don't misunderstand it. I think you ought to share the gospel. I share the gospel, you know, as much as I can when I have opportunities with individuals and tell them about, you know, Christ and Jesus and, you know, what he's done. And, you know, but it's the fact of like, we were being sent out 
we memorized kind of like a salesman type it was a thing. Pitch, it was a, a sales pitch, pitch. Right. And we're trying to discuss theological stuff with people that we've never even met. And the thing about it is because the way that you're indoctrinated in this stuff is if, in, if somebody gives you any other answer other than like, oh, yes, I, I prayed and asked Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior and asked him to come into my heart, and forgive me of my sins on such and such date, on such and such place. And, you know, then immediately you're supposed to start to question whether or not that person is a real Christian. And the problem with that is that, yes, God does save everybody the same way, faith alone through Christ alone, right? But the thing about that is you may have people that are from different denominational backgrounds that don't have the same wording as what I was used to. So here I'd be arguing with somebody at the door, telling them that they're not saved and they need to, you know, repent and pray this prayer because they didn't tell me that they prayed a prayer and asked the Lord to forgive them. Or they may say, yes, I did pray a prayer, but they go to a non-denominational church and that equals, oh, you're going to hell because you don't go to an independent Baptist church. So like that is the, well, even the stuff that's when I was at that. college, um, we had to do this weekly. Um, yeah. Or just, demerit. just to let people know though, that you did go to an IFB college. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. both did. That's where we met. So at, in college, that was part of your activity was a soul winning um, ministry. ministry or something. So um, oh, I signed up for this one and there was this, evangelist woman that was part of the church there. And somehow I got paired with her because we'd go in pairs. And so we were driving around and we had a neighborhood we went to. And I remember specifically that this woman was, you know, everybody's like, oh, she's bold and she, she shares and she, you know, she was just, she had a reputation with her. And I was like, I can't believe I'm going with her. This is a good opportunity for me to learn. And we knock on this door and someone opens it and he just replies. He's like, Oh, well, thank you. I'm just not, I'm just not interested in talking about this. And he goes to shut the door and this woman sticks her foot in the door. I'm not even kidding. (laughs) Would not let the man like, I mean, we're like talking breaking and entering at this point. Right. (laughs) No, I'm just like, what did she just do? And I mean, she's like, no, sir, this is important. I need to talk to you about this. And it's like, okay, that, that is not a good, what is that? No. you know, it was, it was humiliating. I mean, it was just one of those times where you just, I, I don't even know. It was bad. <laughs> like, so. I don't think that that's being bold. I think that that's just being rude and not that's psychotic. That's, that's, that's not, psychotic. that is not the way that like Christ would want us to represent him and his kingdom, you know, where we're just being so rude. Um, like if people don't want to listen, they don't have to listen, right? Like we have an opportunity to, to preach the gospel and share the gospel, but we can't make somebody or force somebody to listen to it. You know, yeah. and I think that's, that's wrong. I think but, also just hearing that story, that just sounds like the wrong motive. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's another thing about oh. independent fundamentalism. <laughs> See, it's all about the numbers, right? Like they will give you, we, we went through a training course about like, you know, and, and it is good to tell people about Jesus, but they, they would give out, um, awards. If you led one person, you would get this pin with a certain color and then, you know, it have like a, a diamond color after 50 people. And then you'd get like a Ruby after a hundred people. And then if you, if you led a thousand people, it'd be like a Sapphire, just, I mean, I'm not well, making this up. You well, can't make it up. Well, like, well, see, that's the thing. But the first church that we were at, so it was an IFB church. I was in charge of doing um, outreach. And the town that we were in was probably about 10,000 people. And in the course of two years, I personally knocked every single door in that town. And I talked with people door to door. Um, when, you know, when was this? Was this before you were married or after? No, this was this was after we yeah, were married because we, yes, yes. we were there at, oh, okay. the, at the church because we were there for nine years. Um, right, right. OK. But yeah, I, I personally talked to every individual in that in that church, in that town. And um, well, I mean, if you could, if they were home, you 
you at well, least stuck literature on their door. Right. But see, the, what I would do is like, if they weren't home, I would mark it down that that person was not home. And then I would come back until I actually made a contact. So I, you know, I walked the streets, I knocked the doors, you know, and this was, this was my, this is what I, I was actually, I did a lot paid for. I did a lot with you. And I remember, right. especially my first year, I, we first got married and I didn't work that year. And I remember in the afternoon, you'd pick me up and we'd go do this. That's yeah. what we spend our afternoons doing, you know? Right. Oh, so yeah, we, we would do that, you know, and, um, you'd wear a shirt and tie, go into the door and, you know, passing out information and stuff. But, you know, I was in charge of, of, uh, that outreach there at the church. And so like, I trained a lot of people too, because I was still stuck in this, this mode of independent fundamentalism and this is how we do it. But there was just something about it. It started kind of irking me. I would probably say that was probably in like 2009, maybe 2000. Yeah, probably about 2009. Because I was like, why is this so mechanical? Why is this like, and like, I started noticing, like, you would talk to people at the door, and you would get them to pray the prayer. But there would be no result of no fruit of that individual ever coming and turning their life, you know, around, like, you wouldn't see them be a part of the church, you wouldn't see them, like, it was just they would say this prayer just either a to get you off their doorstep or b just because of out of obligation like oh, okay yeah i'll say the prayer and that was it right and i was i started thinking like are we actually sharing the gospel with people or are we just getting them to say a prayer so we could have a number to say oh man we had five people pray the prayer last week and and trust christ and you know and then it's like okay so where are those individuals like wh- why are they not growing in their in their faith walk, if they, if this has really happened, if they've had an encounter with Christ, there would be a change. There would be a difference. And I didn't see that. And so I I began to doubt a lot of the stuff that I was being taught. I mean, if we were actually doing it biblically, um, you know, and to me, it just seemed very cold, calculated, mechanical. um, And we had a lot of conversations during this time. And it was just more and more. And, um, you know, we knew there was something wrong, but it was kind of like we were afraid to admit it at first. But I think that was the first step is just, you know, the noticing and, and seeing that things weren't lining up quite with scripture, like we wanted them to. Yeah. Well, and there was, there was a lot of things like, um, I mean, Jamie, with her background, I mean, yeah, she, they did go to an IFB church. Um, but like, um, her mom, um, she had a interlinear Bible. So like she had these, a parallel Bible Bible for, yeah, it had four translations. And Jamie asked me, I remember one time she's like, can I, um, can I get one of these, um, one of these Bibles? And I was like, I, I was still kind of hardcore IFB at that time. And I was like, no, you're not bringing that garbage into this house. That's straight out of the pit of hell. You know, like, no, you weren't. <laughs> yes, okay. I was. Well, he didn't say it quite like that, but he did say, he's like, I don't want that in this house, Jane. You're not yeah. bringing that in. And I was like, oh, well, my mom wanted to get me one for Easter. And we were talking about how helpful it is in Bible study. And I, I just love it. I, I just, I was reading my mom's and it was just really helpful. And, Help, helps me get through some of those difficult passages. And um, it was just a big no. And I was just like, okay, we can't even go there. We're not going to talk yeah. about that in this marriage here. <laughs> well, because I considered it anything else other than the King James was wrong. Yeah. And, and they have a whole teaching on it. It's not like, oh, you're just, how could you believe that? They, they do have a big a teaching that other versions have been corrupted and this and that. And it, it's just a it's, it's a long thing. If you do want to go into that, though, if that's something that your church or you are struggling with, uh, there's a ref, um, a resource that we can recommend, and it's by James White. And what is that book called? Um, it's the called King James. The King James Only Controversy. Yeah. Great resource. Or you can Google on YouTube. Um, there's a good debate with about the King James Only, con- um, King James Only debate with James White. 
or the John Ankerberg one. Both of those are really good. Um, but yeah, so, you know, there was just these little things like that. And then I think really a big turning point for us was um, the pastor that we were working under. Um, he, he hired me and um, I worked for him for three years. And during that time, it was like, I had to be at that man's beck and call, like anything and everything. Like, you know, he told me one time, he's like, you know, I bought this phone for you. So when I call, I expect you to answer. I don't want it going to voicemail, you know, just all this like stuff. Like I had to be Mr. Johnny on the spot, you know, whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. It could be anything from, okay, I need you to run this errand to, I need you to shovel my driveway to, um, you know, just different church tasks. So you were a slave. Well, yeah, but again, like not the fact that I'm not against serving because I love to serve. I enjoy serving. But this was not serving. This This was was not serving. Demanding to the point where it was like, where's my phone? Oh, I left. I left my phone at the house. What am I going to do? Or my phone was on silent. What if he called? And I mean, it was just disruptive. Our marriage was like struggling in a sense because it, there was no sense of that man could come in at any time, not come in, but just call and, okay, you jump and how high, what are we going to do? And so it was really causing problems. And then I think it's important to mention there was another guy that was hired a a couple years or uh, no, No, it was probably about a year and a half, a year later. later. And, um, you know, we were excited because it was like, oh yeah, these, these people, they're our age, they're coming in and it's awesome. But that pastor was pitting uh, this man and Mike against each other to the point where we could not even be friends. And it was just, who is going? Who Wait, is going? Let me, let me back up for a second. So another person came in as like a pastor's helper is what you're saying. Like right? an ass- like so another Mike assistant. Was another the- assistant. Yeah. youth pastor and this man was going to be an assistant with the children and uh so they were both they were not allowed to be called assistant pastors they were assistant, assistant to the pastor right because yeah. <laughs> you guys was, aren't pastors so yeah, right <laughs> and it was very that was emphasized you are yeah. to the pastor i'm the pastor i have the vision i lead this church <laughs> you are here to do what i tell you to do and make this job easy for me right so um so anyway this man came and he was yeah he he was our age and you know it was it was we thought this was going to be great so this pastor would come up with situations to pit mike and this man against each other to see who would serve the pastor more to see who was more loyal. And these were like little loyalty games or something. And it was, it was disastrous. And, and, you know, Mike would come home and be like, I tried to do this. And for, uh, he was, he actually tried, he made like one of those suit valets. Like we picked one up at an antique store and Mike was uh, making this valet for him for his office. So he could put a suit jacket on it. Cause we had strict dress codes at that church too. And Mike was like, really trying to make this surprise for this man, but because there was such a lack of trust in this competition going on that he was like, what are you sneaking around doing? And what do you like? And Mike was just like, I wanted to make this for you. And like, it was just, everything was just suspicion. And there was a Christian school there. And like the, I'm telling you, I have worked jobs at factories and different places, like a factory and uh, an exercise place and different places where this kind of competition and this kind of work atmosphere were not, that, that's just not the way it was. We go into this church and it was just strife and like, it was just a heavy atmosphere. And you think, you're supposed to be working together in this, this atmosphere of love and unity speak. Yes. It was not there. It was, it was competition and, you know, you step on each other's back to get to the top and whoever gets to the top wins. And it, it was just a very strange situation. We noticed it and we backed off. And so Mike was the one who was not loyal to the pastor because he'd just back off and be like, okay, he wins. I can't do this. He yeah. Wins. So basically I would just, I would do what was required of me. I would do my job, 
but I wasn't going to play the game of groveling at your feet. I wasn't going to pretend that you're the king and, you know, poof, whatever you need. Um, I was, I was done with it because I just felt that's not the way that we were supposed to do it. And there was a lot of things like I would, I would talk to him about it. I was very open with him. Um, like we had, like we, we, when we would have these like dinners, um, you were open with the pastor. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. We would have these dinners at the church. Like, you know, it's like a potluck type dinner, but, um, they would have a head table for the pastor, his wife and staff. And Jamie and I would basically refuse to sit there because I'm thinking, why are we making ourselves out to try Isn't to be there's more? Something about like a, James. Yes, James, I just read that. You know, I just, just like, read you know, that. Like it was stuff like that. And I'm just like, why are we doing this? And like, I remember specifically um, the pastor took me, Jamie uh, and this other uh, man staff that was on member. staff and yeah. his wife out um, he took us to the Cheesecake Factory. Like, and it was an hour away. We are literally, we won't, we don't even go to the Cheesecake yeah, we, Factory because it's just like, every time we think about it, we're like, Ew. Yeah. So he <laughs> takes us to the Cheesecake Factory and he sits us down and he starts talking. He's like, all right, you know, this is it. We're the group. We're the people. We're this, we're that. And he's like, he's like, you know, we have to be the most interconnected, you know, people in the church. And we have to, we have to be so tight knit that, you know, we don't have it in a, and on the way, like when we got in the car after that other man left, I asked that pastor a question. I said, um, I said, don't you think by doing that, we're like, not, we're, we're, we're choosing not to associate with the rest of the body of Christ. Like we are, we we're setting ourselves up as like, that we're more important than the rest of the body. And you could tell he, that it just like made him steam and mad because he didn't say anything else. And then it was like later on, he like pulled me into his office and he was like telling me like, I shouldn't be thinking like that, all that kind of stuff. And I'm just like, you know, it's just you're like, not allowed yeah, to think. You're not allowed in to that. Think. <laughs> well, here's so. here's what I'm hearing from this story, though, is just and and because I've known Jamie and Mike for a long time, obviously, I believe I know where Mike's heart was during all this, even though like he was you both kind of were indoctrinated into this. I do believe Mike truly had a heart for God through all of this. And as this stuff, as he was beginning to grow in his own faith and reading the Bible and seeing stuff in James, like we just talked about with not making yourself uh, higher than another person, you started seeing this stuff as, as wrong. Like, why are we doing this stuff? You know, this is contrary to what the Bible has to say. I think people will ask us, well, what's wrong with you? Why didn't you just leave Yeah. at that point? But the story kind of just gets started there. That pastor that we worked for, the one that originally hired me, he ended up leaving. Well, um, he actually said, I, will, I want to stay here until I die. I love this yeah. church. And actually, he was not there very long and <laughs> right? he ended up leaving. So we were just like, oh, yeah, okay, bye. Right. So um, <laughs> he ended up leaving. And, um, it was at that point, I was just like, wow. Like I just, I felt, I felt there was a lot of like betrayal. I felt like there there were lies. It was lies. It was just, there was like a lot of hypocrisy. So the pastor leaves and that leaves me, Jamie, Jamie's working on staff there at the Christian school. Um, and then there was the other man that was hired there and, um, his family that was there. Um, so that just leaves us kind of like in limbo, like, okay, so now what are we going to do? And you took up like the weekly preaching and, yeah. uh, stuff like that and, um, funerals and yeah. So like we, we were without a pastor for about six months. And during that time, I feel like that was the changing point in our thought processes and in our our life and our marriage right because you well, didn't have like an authoritative pastor right. anymore well, yeah when yeah. we were just thinking we're like why did he lie what was going on and you know and i i was thinking back at what happened to you know our parents jen and how they were uh ostracized i do have to say my our dad was actually he accepted jesus as his savior at the church that 
my mom and dad were kicked out of. So at this point, my dad is a Christian, you know, and I'm looking back at that and thinking they were hurt. We were hurt. What's happening here? Is this how every church is? What's going on? Or why would this happen? It's unbiblical. And we, Mike and I started praying and thinking about it. And our prayer was God, there's some traditions here and we see that they're not in the Bible. So please reveal to us, not that there's anything wrong with traditions, but reveal to us where we are elevating tradition above your word. We want to be, we want to be doing what you want to and focus on following scripture, not just what people tell us about scripture, not just our traditions in this denomination, show us what to do. And that is when it started happening. Yeah. Because God started answering that prayer for you guys. It was, because, yes. because here's the funny thing about that, you know, as we're going through the book of Mark and Matthew on the podcast, I mean, Jesus says to the Pharisees so many times that you are elevating your own traditions above the things of God. And that's one of the things that really spoke to us. We're like, we are there, but we don't really know how to fix it yet. And we're not really sure everything that it is yet, but we are, we're moving in that direction. So guys, uh, thanks for tuning in and joining us for this uh, part of this episode. We're going to be doing a two part episode with this and uh, join me next Saturday to hear the rest of this podcast episode with my sister Jamie and my brother-in-law Mike and hear a little bit more about what was about to happen at their church because it gets kind of interesting and also what they do now to um, help people who have been hurt in similar situations. Friends and faithful listeners, thanks for tuning in. Happy listening and God bless. (music) 